Hey folks, Hal here. I know navigation is uh, is the number one thing on most people's list for getting around in the big woods and having a little fear of it and stuff. And the new people that want to start hunting in the big woods. Kind of solve that problem for you. I'm excited to tell you we formed a partnership with Onyx Maps. And with that Onyx Map app on your phone or the chip in your GPS, you'll be able to get around and you'll know right where you are and I like it because I can see the all the old roads and stuff to get out of the woods, and it helps me really scouting now. It saves me a lot of time for scouting and stuff like that because I can see the topography, and then I can flip over and get the aerial and stuff. So why don't you go to onxmaps.com and enter the code promo code BWB, and you're going to get 20% off from Big Woods Bucks and Onyx Maps. This is the Big Woods Bucks Podcast. Come explore the big woods and timber in North America with your host, Maine Master Guide and Deer Tracking Expert, Hal Blood. Listen to Hal and co-host Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy as they unlock the secrets of big woods whitetails. Each episode will provide valuable insights in the tried and true system Hal has used for the last 40 years to scout, locate, and hunt mature big woods bucks. Listen and laugh as the crew discusses Hal's legendary adventures and learn how to apply a lifetime's worth of lessons from the big woods to your own hunting and outdoor adventures. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm your host, Hal Blood, sitting here with my co-host, Lee Libby. Howdy. And Joe Cruzy. Hello. And we got another cohort today. Do you remember Mike Stevens? He, he came down to help us out today. Figured we were struggling a little bit, so. Cohort? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cohort, yeah. Oh, okay. You guys are co-host. Yeah. I got to look into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look too far. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, yeah. So we'll have a little fun today. But first first thing we're going to do today is uh, what they call housekeeping stuff. This yeah. is the part Hal loves. Yeah, housekeeping. This is the part Chris makes me do. So here we go. So in case anybody was didn't know, uh, Woolrich is, is out of business. They're not producing wool anymore, which is kind of affecting our, our uh, clothing with made by silent predators so they're basically we got word they're out of the checkered wool for jackets so we don't chris has got i think three he's got a 3x and two 2x that's what he's got in stock and there'll be no more jackets made for a while good news is is he's meeting with the silent predator on uh any day soon now. yeah soon any day now and They've got samples of another wool to see if it's the same quality and all that from another company. And they'll make a decision whether to use that and move forward. We still have some uh, green wool. If you need pants, there's still some green left, but that'll be out shortly too. And uh, he's got, I don't know, he's got a few checkered vests left, you know, the regular dress type vests. And we do have some packs. And again, that's going to affect the checkered packs for a while. So... But he's got about 20 packs left, and then he's also, we got the camo, various gray and brown, green camos or whatever, gray and brown, I guess. So anyways, if you need any of that stuff, get on it now, especially the packs, because like I said, I don't think anything that's done now, it's going to be iffy whether we get it before deer season. I'm going to say I doubt it. And uh, what else we got going on here? Oh. Lee Libby's got an announcement. Actually, I just texted Chris and said, I want one of them checkered vests. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only a few less, and they look good. Yeah. 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 So, I like mine. Nice. Every, uh, everything looks good on you, Lou. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> we had this conversation one night at Moose Camp, and it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was a good thing. <laughs> Uh, say. Anyway, Liv, get into I that. I told time. you, Mike. My, my he con- doesn't need smoke blown up his ass. Mike, he said it's already Jesus. too big. I told him. I said, lead I, him into something good here, man. <laughs> I've got an extra large cot, but that's it. You can pull yours over next to mine if you want. Okay. But. 
Oh, so anyways, that little short film that we did this last hunting season, the film everybody's been waiting for patiently. Thank you very much. Uh, that made it to the main outdoor film festival, and that's going to be shown in Greenville, Maine, uh, on September 6th at 7 p.m. So if you go on the Maine Outdoor Film Festival website, they'll give you a schedule and time and location and all that. Uh, I'd like to see about 300 deer hunters there. <laughs> yeah. That would be fun. Just mob the place. So you, know. you don't know where it's at yet? Yeah, it's in Greenville. It's at, I think, one of the schools. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I didn't want to speak. Uh, I didn't, I couldn't remember exactly, but you definitely find it on the website, but. Uh, that'll be fun and then from there uh, I did spend uh, a few hours with the guy that shot the film last Saturday evening and uh, we're going to work on getting that released on the website and the Facebook page and all that good stuff so sounds good yeah but, looking but forward to, to it get to the festival to support Lee on that and then uh, we'll post it when you find out Lee we'll post it on the Big Woods site yeah. too the location and all of that stuff yeah. I think it'd be good for the uh, I mean, I know everybody's busy and they all got a life, but the kids will be back to school. So, is that a Friday night? Yeah, Friday night. Friday. So, if people yeah. can, as many deer hunters over in that country that can show up, I think it'd be a pretty good statement to the Maine Outdoor Film Festival folks that, hey, maybe we ought to have a few more of these hunting videos. Yeah. You know, because you don't very often see an actual hunting video in that Maine Outdoor Film Festival. But, right. This see a year, lot of lighthouses. Lighthouses and kayakers and all good stuff. Don't get me wrong. Looms. All that stuff's good, but I like to see some killer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when Mike cracks himself up. <laughs> hey, uh, congratulations. Lip. He just oh, chimes in with a little <laughs> loons. <laughs> hey, Joe, Joe, wait a minute. I just parked next to a guy that had Bernie Sanders stick. Oh. Okay? oh, my God. Yeah. Not him again. In, no. Joe, in Joe's driveway. Oh, yeah, I, I well, ran a guy. Just to, it's not my personal driveway. Let's be clear. And I've already called Kelvin to tell him. Uh, <laughs> I ran a guy off once that had a Hillary sticker in the parking lot over there. And yeah, that that was <laughs> that, that was funny. That yeah, was. <laughs> libs are running all my customers off. <laughs> Look, in the summertime, oh. you know, a well, few liberals come up. The guy came the lodge, around. You know? Guy like came the around. To, Guy yeah. came around the corner and I'm scraping the Hillary sticker off with my buck knife <laughs> <laughs> on his Audi, scratching the <laughs> shit out of it. <laughs> Should you be releasing this information? <laughs> well, uh, well, hey, congratulations, Lib. Oh, you know, thanks, film. That's awesome. That's awesome stuff. Yeah, another movie star in the family. That's awesome. Yeah, and this one's named after. Did I see the the title of it is just Lee. Yeah, it is. That's yeah. the title. The huh? first movie was the guide. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but. Uh, that was a good one, but that was awesome. This one was Lee. Mikey was a Un part of that. Un guy. Unfortunately, that not not enough people remember it, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> it should have got more acclaim than it did. It was actually uh, pretty good, from what did I understand. Did you see it? I didn't. Oh. I heard. I heard good stuff about it, though. Me and Mikey are down in Rumford, Maine. I know how it wants to get going on this, but Mikey, no, no. Mikey got all day. Mikey's in the house. We get stories. So, <laughs> me and Mikey are in Rumford, Maine. Who else helped us? Uh, me, you, and Kev. Kev showed up. Yeah, Kevin one, Harrison. Two days, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And we're in Rumford. We're shooting this scene in this old abandoned apartment house. And there's people riding up and down the streets on bicycles, and they're trying to steal shit out of my trailer. <laughs> <laughs> and Mikey's standing at the end of the road, and all he had to do was say, "Hey," <laughs> and they'd drop whatever they had in their hands and run. <laughs> Mikey came up to me. He says, "Lib." You can do what you want, he says, but we probably ought to be out of here before it gets dark. <laughs> <laughs> Is Rumford really that bad? Well, his, uh, that neighborhood was. <laughs> remember, they were, we were looking for an abandoned uh, apartment building. Yeah. <laughs> Not hard to find in Rumford. But, but also, we wanted to make a, a crack house in within the building. Yeah. We didn't have to make that either. <laughs> <laughs> it was already, there was needles on the floor. Everything oh. else. Remember that lift? Yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I, I don't... <laughs> I don't think you guys are going to be invited to join the Visit Rumford ad campaign anytime soon. Well, the neatest part was was we found the guy that said he owned the building, right? This is a great And uh, I said, so we need this building for a shoot for a couple of days. And he says, yeah. 
I'll give you the building for a couple hundred bucks. I says, a couple hundred bucks a day? He says, no, just give me 200 bucks. You can have the building. So we're there for two or three days, two, two days, three days shooting. Three days, we're about yeah. wrapped up. And the town manager stops by. And he says, what are you doing? I says, we're shooting a movie. And he goes, well, that's city property. I says, no, I gave the owner 200 bucks to rent it. He says, like I said, that's city property. <laughs> Limp guy didn't even own the didn't building. Didn't even own the building. <laughs> Shows you how savvy the guy was. If he was really savvy, he would have got 200 bucks a day. Oh, <laughs> crazy. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And that town manager says, well, the good thing is it's Friday afternoon. The bad thing is, if you're here Monday, I'm calling the cops. <laughs> <laughs> so we were out of there. Wrapped it up. Huh? Wrapped it up. Oh, yeah. That was fun. It, is there any place to find that now? I think we talked about it on what, you, I've got last a couple year copies. or something. You know what happened to that? And, and I know a little bit about the movie stuff now from, you know. But the distribution of a film, any film, is key. And when you pick a distributor, you really have to pick the right person. Who, who owns the rights to it now? I have no idea. You Couldn't should find you. out because with show, social yeah. media now, I mean, maybe yep. maybe it would have a second chance. I can remember listening to a conversation and there was a director and one of the investors were talking to a potential distributor. A distributor. And this young kid from L.A. is like, hey, I'll guarantee you 400000 in sales in the first six months, blah, blah, blah. Sounded great. And then this old guy Another conversation. Well, he says, there's really no guarantees in life. I'll do the best I can, da-da-da. And one of the investors says, yeah, I think I want to go with the, the old fellow that doesn't make any guarantees. And I'm like, well, even if the guy that guaranteed us 400000 sells 200000 does half of what he said he was going to do, we pay all the investors back and we're whole. No, I don't, I don't deal with any, anybody that makes guarantees. So there was no guarantee. I think we sold a a bunch to Walmart. I think the investors got paid back less than half of what they invested. That's what you call a bust. Yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. But it was really, the, the storyline on it was about the only place you could go f- to make a deer hunting story out of, a, a, you know, a movie out of a deer hunting yeah. story, you know, like the old guy's got to save his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> and the only way to do it is a high pr- highfalutin <clears throat> guy from the city. Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. That movie got rewritten as we produced it, didn't it? They were rewriting yeah. it every night. Yeah. Well, it, we had to throw some main terms in there once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. The yeah. actor was really good. Don Scribner. Yeah. Anybody ever knows Don? Uh, look him up on Facebook. He does a lot of stuff. And I can uh, I can <clears throat> bet that you've seen him somewhere. Oh yeah, Don's you've seen him a lot yep. of stuff. And right. Yep. He's got that Sam Elliott look. And yeah. Right. That's exactly right. He, <laughs> yeah. he fit the role well. Yeah. yeah. And then he's in good shape for his age. You know, he played me in the movie, and he was 60 then, weren't he? 60 something. Yeah. 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 Actually, he's yeah. a year younger than me. He's 60. Yeah. He, yeah. That guy was in shape, man. When he broke through the ice, he just oh, kept, yeah. never even stopped the film. Yeah. Just yeah. broke the ice and fell in and just kept walking. It was, and then they left it right in. That was perfect. We were Skyping him. He was in LA, and we were Skyping him for the, the role. And he had a ponytail, long gray ponytail. And he's kind of scary looking anyways when he's got his full beard on, you know. And I said, is there any way I can get you to cut that ponytail? Because I have a military haircut. Always have. And he says, nope. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh. Anyways. All right. So everyone go out and see the guide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I mean Lee. Yeah. I want to see Lee. Yeah. All right. Well, what do you say we uh, answer some question of the month questions again? They've been building up a little bit. I think I'm going to switch the whole thing over to doing it on this because I got thinking about it. In the the, uh, the there's a lot of good questions and and it'd be nice to have a bigger audience that hears the answers and just the club members. And I'm sure that most of the club members listen to the podcast anyway. So I decided that's what I way I wanted to go with it. So you're the boss. He is the boss. Hal, when I met him years ago, he said, you have no idea, Lib. <laughs> Things have changed. There was a day when it was my way or the highway, and I'm thinking, what was that, yesterday? <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say, did that ever change? <laughs> now he just says it nicer. <laughs> he does. <laughs> uh, <so. clears throat> my way or the highway, yeah. yeah. 
now. I can roll the punches pretty good now. Yeah, you're much more. It's difficult, yep. but I can do it. Well, I think you realize there was no change in. Can't change people like Mikey. He just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he tried. Well, I'm waiting for Joe to get me online so I can queue up the Is questions. that what you've been doing over there the whole time, <laughs> trying to get online? My God. I thought he needed his glasses or something. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> this morning, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to be prepared because I get accused of not being prepared for this stuff. So this morning, I get up at 530. I get on the emails, and I get into the question of the month ones, queued them all up printed them out, or so I thought. When I walked out of the house, there was no paper stuck out of the printing machine. So for some reason, they didn't print. So I... Uh, You're connected, Al. I just grabbed my laptop, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to get them off we're, of that. We're at minute 15. I think Hal's been trying to get on there for the last 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got me and Lib to ad, ad lib for him until he gets things going. There. Yeah. <laughs> He just sits in the corner and rolls his finger like, keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. So, Mikey, you're booked up for birds, you said? Birds, moose, deer, the whole shooting match. Yeah. Nice. It's going to be a good fall, good long nice. fall. Yeah. Nice. Bear hunt's going to be a little slow, ain't it, Mikey? I think <laughs> we're kind, of, we're kind of still, the judge is still out on that one right now. Holy cow. Yeah. How many of the kids get last night? They, got a, they got a few there. Rocky Ashy's boy got one. Uh, and then uh, there, there was one or two other ones. Yeah. Oh, was there? No, yeah. Not many as you thought they'd be. No. But it's not, it's not that kind of year, huh? Yeah, they're not eating much. There's every, I don't know, it's been a while since I've seen a year like this with just this a, every kind of food you could think of in the woods. I loaded. mean, it's great for the animals. It really is. It's it's everything, though. And everything's loaded. It ain't just like a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I actually, I'm not much of a blueberry picker or a berry picker because it seems like you're wasting your time. You know, I'd rather get out and buy a couple of quarts, you know. <laughs> 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 the blueberries were so thick. I took I took Deb last weekend or well, last week sometime one afternoon. I said, let's get out and pick some blueberries. And I don't know, we, we spent about two hours there and, I nearly filled my bucket. It was like one of them, I don't know, gallon bucket, I guess. It must have been a gallon bucket. Hers a little over half filled. Mine was almost full in two hours. I couldn't believe how thick wow. the blueberry. You could just just get in a bush and pick the bush up and just rake them right into your bucket. I'd never seen them like that. Man, it's crazy in the woods, huh? These yeah. Mountain ash. I went up in the woods yesterday. I was looking around for deer. This one trail, the mountain ash was hanging right over the trail like, you know, you had to push it out of the way to get through. Yeah. Oh, cr I see the choke cherries up there on the Sky Lodge Hill like that by Billy Reed. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're almost, the bushes are almost hanging in, in the road. There's so many choke cherries on them. Hmm. It's unreal. Speaking of Sky Lodge, is that where the moose lottery is next year? Yep. 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 Nice. So, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Sky, uh, John Corey, the guy that has owned it for years and years and fixed it all up and stuff. He's donated it to Unity College. Nice. And uh, so now they got some college programs there. Unity College is kind of an outdoor college that teaches people uh, forestry and all that stuff. So they have in a co they got the college there. But yeah, so next year the moose lottery is going to be right here in town. It's going to be cool. Yeah. Did you get the uh, email regarding the next meeting? No, you it, didn't get me on the list all right, yet. It's it's on the well. I'm telling you now. It's on the 28th. If you tell me now, as soon as I leave here and get in my truck, I forgot about it. <laughs> All right. I'll so put a sticky note on your steering wheel. How about forwarding the email to me? Oh, I didn't know if you'd be able to open it or not. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> and then you know what I do if it's an email I need to remember? Oh. I, I put one of those flags on it. I know how to oh. do that. Oh, yeah. Shit. I click a flag on it. I'll, I'll forward it to you here in just a bit. Yeah. As soon as I yep. can see through my broken it, LCD, LED, LCD screen on there on yep. my phone. It comes up in a little different color when I f put the flag on it. <laughs> then you know it's important. Yep. <clears throat> so I'll so, do that. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's just coming up week anyway. This week here? Yep, yep. I believe so. So I'll see what day it is. Wednesday. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I got something else Wednesday. Anyway, we'll talk later. Yep. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions here. They're good ones, too. I'm going to start at the 
first one we received here. All right. This one is from Josh Coro from Charlotte, Vermont. Is it usually worth your time to start back on a track once you have to leave it for the night or worth locating another one the next morning? I assume he means getting back, like picking the track up in the same place. We've talked a little bit about it before. Probably young bucks oh. like Lee would get right on it and run for three, four hours in the morning to catch up, right, Lee? No. 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 <laughs> the only the only time, and I've talked about it before, we did it is we had one that, that we had just a little drop of blood with. We knew we'd hit it. Yeah. And and we got back on it, and we killed him the next day, and it was a big buck, and it was it worked well. But you don't know where that, that thing might go, you know, 15 miles in the night. You yeah. never know. I think it's uh, worth checking out, though. Yeah, I mean, but if I it's think four, I, I go back to the, the same s- area. Depend on the scenario. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, if it's four miles in or five miles in, right, you leave right. it. I ain't yeah. hiking that. No, much. no, no. I mean, the scenario would you know, plus the size of the track and the buck might dictate something too. Right. right. I've done it a few times, but and I've I actually the biggest one I killed in Maine was I didn't go back on it, but I know it was two days old. But uh, it was the first week of the season. I think sometimes either the first week or the last week it could be worth you time to do it but and we had uh remember when we had rick labby on there he he said he goes back he doesn't now that's i think some people might have been a little confused about that um, if they were he doesn't go back and get on the track where he left it he goes back into the same area where that buck is and tries to pick up where he's either yeah. loop back around or whatever it is yeah. but yeah so it's a judgment call but i guess how much patience and or maybe stamina you have to do it but and probably depends also if you're in an area that maybe there's only a couple of bucks in the whole area, you might want to do it. You know, he's there somewhere if you keep going. But, you know, usually you can pick up another track to get going on. Or well, like you said, if you go back to that area, you're probably going to pick up him or maybe another one. But yeah, to sure. hang a flag in the tree or mark it with a GPS and try to go right back to that spot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if he crossed the road while he was on the way to the pickup truck, well, yeah. Yeah, situational thing. Yeah, you know, I, I think Rick had indicated a couple times that he's seen where they come back out of the area, back across the road or something, and uh, you'd get back on it the next day. But it, but again, you're not going all the way where they went yeah. in the night. They might have gone five miles in one direction and looped back around or something, you know. We'll have to corral Rick back over again sometime before deer season. That was a, a lot of good feedback on that episode, too. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of guys enjoyed listening to that. Now, Rick just made a film, didn't he, or something? Wrote, wrote an article. article. Oh, was that what it was? Oh, okay, yeah. I, I just caught a glimpse of it there. I haven't, I haven't picked it up yet. I got to grab it. No, he yeah. said it's just coming out. I guess last week, I think it did. Yeah, yeah. I just saw it the other day, two weeks ago, something. Yeah, Dave Willett had right had got him to do it. He Rick wrote it, and then I guess well, wherever he did, he edited it, or whatever he did to it, but it's on the North American Whitetail, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. This question is from uh, Micah Sawyer from Wyndham, down your neck of the woods. Well, we both grew up down around there. Yeah. Hey, Hal. I'm new member on the BWB Club. Thanks for joining. And love what you guys have available to learn about tracking in the big woods, along with the podcast, which I always look forward to. Anyway, fairly new to tracking. I've yet to kill one on the track, but my question is, when you're on a fairly fresh track, when do you know or what is a good sign the deer gives you to leave the track and try to cut him off or make a loop and try to get in front of him? I've been in situations where I thought making a loop or even backtracking might get me a look at him, but making that decision with little experience is difficult. Thank you and happy hunting. Well, there's a lot to that question, I think, you know, because everybody does stuff different, but. That goes back. That's exactly what Rick was talking about in the last one. And I think basically what he was in, in the situation he was liking it was if the if the buck he keep, keeps on jumping it and the buck is stopping and waiting for him. Yeah. He does it then and you know, but like you said there's a lot of different scenarios in that. I I, I I've done it before uh um where I had a problem. It got into a, you know, if a buck gets into a bunch of other deer tracks and you're taking so much time trying to work it out i'll just take off and do a big loop around and and try to pick it up or try to get in front of them and it's it's worked 
before where I've gotten in front of them. Sometimes it hasn't. Right. I like you yeah. thinking, Micah, because if you if you're giving us a question like that, you you you're definitely on the ball as far as getting out there and and you know uh, coming up with ways to find your buck. So I like the way you're thinking, and and I'm like Joe. I think I pretty much do the same thing Joe would. Um, Liv, what about you on that one? Yeah, I think it would have to be where I was jumping him and he wouldn't let me near him or to circle. But I can remember I lost one in New Hampshire once to another hunter because I looped around <laughs> and he got shot right in front of me. And the old man, I called the old man that night and I said, geez, I kind of made a mistake today. I, I looped when I, I zigged when I should have zagged. And he says, well, if you'd have stayed on that buck track, you'd have probably killed it. <laughs> so, well, I, I don't, I don't do it much. I I always felt I was better off knowing exactly what that buck did. If you as soon as you leave the track, you don't know what the heck's going on. But uh if you get in those thick spots and you know he's right ahead of you and you want to try to, you know, keep yourself out around, you know, where you don't have to break a bunch of stuff or whatever, but to me it's always been the situation, you know, what I do one day I might not do the next. It's exactly what you see in the woods. If there's a chance that I think it might work, I might give it a try, but I usually feel like when I leave the track to make a loop, it's costing me time, too. It's got, you know, I don't know what's going on on the track, plus I'm losing time. And the only exception, like I said, is if I think he's bedded down, then, then time isn't as much of a factor if he's fed around and he went to lay somewhere, and I think I can loop up around to something. But, but <clears throat> that's, that's one of the reasons that I would do it is because I feel like I'm losing time if, I'm, if it's in a situation. You know, sometimes – you think that just because there's snow and and it's a bigger track that you could easily just work it out and figure out which way you went, but you go into a place that all of a sudden that track gets into an area where there's a couple of bucks chasing a hot doe around, it's a mess. Oh, that's a definite you know, situation. It's a you mess. Gotta, yeah, and you yeah, just gotta. I don't even. I don't even try to decipher it when it looks like. Yeah, that's a different loop. loop. You know, but I think well. that's a different scenario than what he's asking about. Is that's like looping to to stay on the track more than. Right. Looping to try to, you know, get ahead of where you think he is right now, you know. Yeah, it's it's a tough, tough thing. I know. I, I'll leave I've left the track many times if I if I catch one going in bluffs and, and real ugly stuff that, you know, you know, I can't get up that stuff anymore. So yeah, I might loop around because I know the I know the the ridge and I know where they lay and all that and I'll loop around and try to come in the back way on him or something. Or maybe he come down out of a bedding area and I grab his track again. But yeah, you know, I'd leave one for that that uh, that scenario. But yeah, that's a great question, Micah. Yeah, I started when I'm hunting over in the Adirondacks. I I learned because it's it's a lot more open country over there, and if they're heading up into the top of a ridge or top of a mountain, you can see so good there that I've I've done that over there a little bit more when I don't think I'm losing time. If I think he's going up there. I'll get off the track and just try to get to the top and then ease along the top and look down. But it's it's just because it's different woods. Over here, usually, when you get up into the top, it's green growth. You can't see 20 feet in anyway, so it's right. you're not gaining much, you know. I think that leads us into another another uh, thing that Hal might want to talk about this because he's the best at it. <laughs> and it's like hunting uphill. Huh, Hal? That's really tough for a lot of people to to hunt uphill like that and stay behind a deer that might be looking back at them. And I know you're the best at it, and you might want to explain some of that. Well, getting up them hills is a little tougher now. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you meant? No, no, no. I mean, oh. the, the, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> old fire like you, but anyway. <laughs> I'll never be as old as you. No, man. you will not. <laughs> oh. uh, well, that's it. That's I've always said it's when you're going uphill on them like that, they're going to see you anyway. They always feel vulnerable, like a neon sign when you're yeah, doing that. You got that. I have once in a while, if the situation's right, several times I've come up hill and caught them either laying down or getting up because they might get up over like a, a crest in the hill and they didn't actually lay where they could see all the way down. I've done that a few times or in a in a – good snowstorm where it's snowing hard and the wind's blowing i feel i'm better off to stay on the track even going uphill because you know they they don't want to go you know what i mean they're kind of they if they're laying down in a snowstorm and the wind's blowing i think they're more likely to 
give you that extra second to get a shot when they get up if you go easy and just poke and go. But, you know, I always said if you if you don't get them that way, it's easier to kill a buck where you can than it is to think you're going to kill one where you can't, you know. So right, that's the way I just operate, you know. And I, I blow more of them than probably anybody else anyways, but I just go enough to make the right ones count, you know. It, you know, something else – just came to mind is you're also i think a lot of guys get into open hardwoods and they like it they think oh i can see forever here and see the deer but they can see you too forever (laughs) yeah (laughs) and so that's why i i always like it when you end up in a down in a bog or something where it's flat and it's a lot of blowdowns and stuff because he's liable to be right there anywhere at that point yeah, I yeah. know that uphill thing. I've shot at a lot of them running. I've been running them away from the uphill. I don't think any dragged yeah. any of them down over there, but I yeah. shot at a lot of them. <laughs> I like those mixed growth choppings there where you can, it's green, a lot of green in it and stuff, uh, but you can see down the skid roads and you can kind of peek around everywhere. Those, those are good places to catch up. Hey, Hal, here. Just want to take a minute to talk about the hunting club and, uh, You can join by going right online at uh, bigwoodsbucks.com. But anyways, I've got uh, all my information is going in there, and it's a place where you can get together and and, uh, look at my films, tips, writings, and all of that. And the best part is is, is, is forums for you to communicate with, you know, the rest of the club members, talk about Big Wood stuff and all of that. So anyways, 36 bucks a year. Cheap and getting a Starbucks once a day, so join up and hope you see you're on there. Hey everyone, Hal here. Just want to take a minute to talk a minute about uh, the Woodman Arms muzzleloader. We uh, we got them all set on the website to build your own and uh, or buy your uh, Big Woods Bucks model, either one you want to do. But anyways, we've tested a lot and it's I can honestly say it's the most accurate muzzleloader on the market best to carry in the big woods or anywhere else at five and a half pounds you can't go wrong with it so get on there and check it out yeah everybody likes the open hardwoods couldn't you see but they can they can see further than you can you know right and all they got to do is cross an opening and they'll stand on the other side and as soon as they see movement coming on their track they're gone you probably won't even see them they just turn and go again you know yeah yeah that's why you got to keep going on them until eventually they'll get somewhere where the woods changes, the conditions change, and, and then you might get a chance at them. Too many people, I think, worry about getting them every time. You know what I mean? It's just you ain't going to get them every time or every chance. You know, you just have to have, I always said it's the two points connecting in the right place in the right time, and that's it. Yeah, so that's where that whole persistence thing come in. <clears throat> just keep after it and keep after it, and yeah, that eventually yeah. those two points work out. Every yeah. time I get out of that truck and I'm loading that Ot six, I'm gonna kill a deer. That's just the way I approach the day. If it's you know, and you, know, you got to approach the day that way, you know. And like Hal says, of course you don't get one every day. I'd be foolish to say that, but but you got to have that attitude. And you know that's one thing I've always kept that attitude forever. I'm gonna kill them. I'm going out there. I'm gonna get them. And I think that helps helps hang them on the wall. It really does, you know. You can't have a nonchalant shit attitude when you get in the woods because that's what you're going to end up with. Nothing, you know. You gotta, you gotta want it. Well said. Well said. <laughs> it's all a mental game, right, Mike? The guru likes me. <laughs> Jeez. Until <laughs> uh. this is a, actually, actually, folks, we we do get along. <laughs> We're like a bunch of married people sometimes, but we do get along. <laughs> All right, here's another question from Zach Lafreniere from Howland, Maine. I've heard mixed opinions about this, but I want to hear from you fellas. Myself, when I finally break the silence and take a shot at a buck, I fire until he's out of sight. No harm in shooting until you're out of ammo. One, out of ammo. Two, can't see him anymore. Oh, I'm going to let Lee feel this one. The past few years in a row, I've shot deer that have given me a glimpse to take another poke as they bounded away. My opinion is shoot until you can't anymore. You've already made the noise. Let them have it. So my question is, 
Trust your first shot placement or shoot until out of sight. What do you think, Lee? Yeah, keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends where you are. If you're downtown <laughs> Athens or something, you know, maybe not. But where we hunt, if you ain't seen a boot track all day, then pretty good chance you can send them. But never stop shooting until uh, he, he's either on the ground or can't yeah. see him anymore. I mean, it's just too many people shoot and say, I got him the first shot. You yeah. know, they see him run off and yeah. they think they made a good shot. That one last year was blood coming out of him everywhere. And he was standing 30 yards and I was still shooting, standing there dying. I'm like, lay down. I'll <laughs> yeah. quit shooting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we always talk about with moose hunting too. I mean, Oh yeah, you keep yeah. shooting until they're on the ground. Yeah, I know not everyone does that, but that's my belief. Yeah, yeah. I just, always you got I nothing to do. lose. Maybe a little bit of meat. I look at it know, this but, way: if you were shooting me, I'd want you to keep shooting until I wasn't moving. <laughs> Get it over with. Yeah, <laughs> come up with this stuff. <laughs> uh, but you know, you you've uh, you you've worked so hard for that one shot, you know, and. If he's gonna if he's gonna run away and, and keep giving you a ham to shoot at, I know I'm I'm shooting. I know I've shot at a few of them. I go back to the lodge's house. Says, How many times did you fire? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. we all try to make that first shot good. You know yeah. what I mean? But yeah, he's yeah. right. Once you start sending them, it, it seems to me it's like a natural instinct. It's even if I, for me, if I know I hit him good, you know, I see it hit or I see him hump or whatever. I still shoot. I don't I don't take that for granted. I yeah. keep shooting. But the caveat I'd say to that is 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 I don't pull the trigger until I got it on him again. I'm not just emptying the Same, gun to right. sake of emptying right. it. Oh, no. yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Every every opening I get a chance in and I'll I'll poke another one down there. I've got a video on an old camera that I mounted to the gun. I think Hal's seen it where I shot that eight pointer and uh Remember that I tracked that buck, and then I turned the camera on, and I see another bigger buck, and so I broke off on that one's track, got on the bigger buck track. I didn't get a shot at him, and I was on that big buck track, and all of a sudden I heard something go, and I looked, and all I could see was antlers going through, and on the video you can see where I pull ahead of the deer. There's an opening where I shoot the first time, and you can see in the video it hits a deer. And it goes about, tw I pull right forward. You can see it. It's clear as day. I pull right forward to the next open. And as soon as he comes into it, I pull the trigger. Hits him there. I pull the head another 20 yards. He comes into the open. And I pull the trigger. Boom. He goes down. I set the camera down, the gun down, to grab my other camera out of my backpack. And I hear this. And I look to the right. And that big bastard standing there. <laughs> I'm like, you son of a gun. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, well, I'm not that far from New Hampshire. No, Lip, stop thinking like that. <laughs> <laughs> he runs off, so I run up. Edit the, that out. Yeah. It was a decent 8.180 something. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of a, like Hal said, you got to at least see some brown. I don't ever just let them send them, you know. Where Where can that film be seen? I've got that on an old computer. If the computer still works, I've got that somewhere. Was Kev with you that day? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I thought it was in one camera. You're going to release it with your no. film festival one? I never told you guys that story about the guy I was working for. I, I left him a nod on his forehead. Did I ever tell you that story? I'm going to refill my coffee while we get ready to hear this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, but I want to hear it. <laughs> I was doing a job for this guy. He was building a big house and... Uh, he said something about tomorrow. I said, hey, listen, if there's any snow on the ground, I probably ain't going to be here. So he says, well, can you let me know? And I said, sure. So I get up 4.30 in the morning, and I jumped in the pickup truck, and there's a dust and a snow at my camp. And I knew, you know, and I'm at like 1,300 feet, so I knew once I get up into 2,000 or better, it's going to be snow. So I ran down to the job site, and I took a two-by-four out of the scrap pile, and I wrote on it with a black marker, Lee's not here. And I nailed it across the door open. <laughs> well, he, he was gumming around, never even noticed that two-by-four, and took it right in the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the good thing is, by 9 o'clock, I was back to work with that buck in the truck, you know. So, Yeah. Anyways. Nice. 
All right. Well, that was a good question. Yeah. I'm getting all excited for dinner. I don't know about you guys. Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> we yeah. get talking yeah. about this stuff. Just the leaves right now, man. Yeah. The, the, the leaves swamp, are changing good. Swamp maples uh, are red, huh? It's crazy. Yeah, up in the ridges, though, that's the tinge of orange has started. You, you know, when it just goes from that green to that little bit of a tinge. You Cold start, morning this morning. Yeah. Yep. 40 degrees this morning. Two spike horns on my lawn. Two, two or three days ago, they came down and crossed. Oh, yeah? Yeah. They, You know, one had big, big spikes. The other one was just a little guy. But, um, geez, look at this. <laughs> I had two, yeah. does on the, two does on the lawn this morning while I was making my coffee. Yeah. They're dubbing around. Huh. Yep, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. We, but don't wish the time away. No. 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 We've got a lot to do. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this question is from Charles Cutler, a puka, a poka, a popka. A popka, a popka Florida. Florida, yeah. Down your neck of the woods there. Where oh, you yeah. Up, so. I've been to a popka. All uh, right. I've been there, too. Thanks for listening all the way down there in Florida. I was just reading about the heaviest buck shot in Maine in 2018, and it triggered a question I've had since reading the Benoit books a few years ago. When hunting the same buck for more than one day, what's the best way to pick up the track following the following day? You go right back to it. It seems <laughs> like going to the spot you left the night before would put you way behind. Is there another way of going about it? I guess... It's similar to the first question we had there, so we pretty much covered that. You know, it's uh, yeah. Who's fielding the questions? Who's in charge of the questions? Yeah, I was going to ask that because it's kind of redundant. Yeah. Hey, these guys don't even know each other, and they had the same question. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> so it's you've already got the answer if you're listening, Charles. <laughs> yeah. All right. What do we got next to you? That was anticlimactic. Yeah. All right. Here we go. This is from Adam Arquette, Whitehall, New York. I know that name. Yes, I think we see him on uh, the Facebook and stuff. <clears throat> Dear BWB team. I he just said on the Facebook. <laughs> on the Facebook. <laughs> Where do you see it? <laughs> on Facebook. What did I, what did I say, Mike? <laughs> I'm not. I don't get where this is going. It's the <laughs> come on, Joe. He's laughing hard over there, folks. But we, we don't know why. Just... <laughs> what you uh, put? In, did you put a gummy in your coffee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god, Mike! Somehow I think he's it making was, fun of me. Was, but I'm not sure. It was wow. On the Facebook. <laughs> I think. It, yeah. I, I think. Uh, it, I don't know. All right. What was on the Facebook, Hal? All right. <laughs> I have plans for hunting Maine for the first time this coming season. Awesome. Between topo maps and Google Earth, I have left half a dozen. I have half a dozen areas picked out for some boots on the ground scouting hunting once November comes around. I am an experienced deer tracker from the Adirondacks, so I'm used to low deer densities, and I know what terrain features will hold deer around home. After I circled a few areas that looked good on the map, I looked at some main deer harvest reports, maps from previous seasons. A few of the areas I chose had only one deer and no deer reported for each season. I tell you right now, that's the place to go because there's nobody hunting there. There you go. Yeah. My questions are, one, how would you tell, if at all, Use a harvest report to decide on a place to look for deer. All right. We're going to cover that. We're not going to read all. He's got a few questions here, so. Depends where he's going at first. <clears throat> you got to kind of know where he's going. You know, if you, I mean, we got townships up here that don't even get hunted in, in upstate Maine, probably, you know. So if you see a township that's got one deer, don't don't look at that as there's no deer there. Look at it as it, like Hal just said, hey, no one's hunting up there right now, you know. I, <clears throat> Yeah, I do that with moose hunting. I don't. I don't pay. I don't really look at it for the deer harvest. I I use it a lot for. Uh, I look at the moose harvest for townships, and I I go where the fewest are killed. You know, not, I don't just only hunt there. But when I'm using those, when I'm looking at the townships, I'll go through and, you know, there might be a township where there's thirty or forty moose killed in one township. Well, that's because it's only 
you know, there's a, you know, camps that are right there and everyone's going out from the camps and they're just killing them as they leave. Yeah. And, uh, I like to go where there's fewer killed. Yeah. I, I would, I'd say another thing about that is quite frankly, if especially people that hunt in the North Maine woods, and I don't know if that's where you've, you've picked out Adam, but anyways, that's, uh, you know, the remoter areas, not around towns and stuff. Quite often when people are hunting there, they don't know what township they're in because some of them are only have numbers on them anyway. That's a real good point. So yeah. I know like, uh, I know like, for example, I mean, for as long as I've been looking at them, like Dole Pond Township, there's always a lot of deer. You look at the surrounding areas and there's, there's only a few deer and then that one township. And I'm going to tell you, they ain't killing them all in that township. It's that that's where they are. They're up there camped around. Everybody refers to it as Dole Pond. So they go tag their deer and it's Dole Pond and it might have been T5R6 or whatever, <laughs> something else. The, the other part of that is, is uh, <clears throat> I would say not, not everyone's truthful about where they're killing their. Yeah. No one wants to put it on their, you know, yeah. where they yeah. killed it. So they'll, they might be off by a township or two or so. <laughs> Five. Yeah. I mean, you know, I. A lot of times they'll say, you know, mark on the map. Oh, well, geez. If you're over an inch on the map, it might be six miles away or something. And, yeah. uh, you know, in a different township. So guys, are, as we all know, are pretty secretive about where they kill deer. So I wouldn't put a thousand percent faith. Yeah. In, I would put, I think for me, I guess the simple answer would be that if you see a township that there seems to be a bunch more deer killed, just expect you're going to see a bunch more hunters i mean that's just the equation the more deer there are killed obviously there's more hunters there because it's not going to change i mean there's certain areas in the state that do have very few deer if you get into the kind of some of the central area central part of the north main woods there won't be as as many deer as the peripherals but uh i wouldn't uh i wouldn't put all that much into it like you said you're gonna have to do a little boots on the ground and any place you have a, you get in any place that's got a mixture of, you know, hardwood and softwood and rolling ridges. If you can't find some deer sign pretty quick, then you're probably not in the right place. But he's used to, he's used to humping around those Adirondacks. So I got a feeling he's not going to have any problems up here. He'll be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. The second question is, are the areas completely devoid of deer? or just in such low numbers that success rates are basically zero. One of the areas I looked like, I looked, it looked like a decent-sized track of unbroken mature forest that would certainly hold deer where I live, but only deer, one deer was harvested in that township in 2018. <coughs> Do mature woods hold deer in Maine, or is it necessary to be around the cuts? I guess that's more than one question. But any tips are appreciated. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Adam. I think that goes right back to... Wait a minute. Just wait. This is for you, Lee. P.S. None of the areas I mentioned are near Rangeley. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the heads up, Lee. Uh, <laughs> he says thanks for the heads up, Lee. Yeah, uh -huh. You're welcome. Yeah. I think it goes right back to if there's only one deer killed there, there's probably only a half a dozen people hunting it. You know? Yeah. So his sec second part of it was, was I think he's asking too, is if I don't know where you found any That's what I was going to say. Of mature forest. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it must be a private uh, piece of land down by the coast or something. It's either that or he's over in Baxter Park there. There's quite a bit of mature yeah. forest yeah. over there. But That's yeah. a good place to go. Happy hunting. Yeah. Even, uh, but there, are, there, are, you can still walk back in and find some, you know, mature woods and places. But, uh, yeah, it's. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I know. I've I sure. love hunting mature woods just because, yeah. even if there's not as much sign, it's just a nice place to hunt. You yeah. know, yeah. it's a. Yeah. You get into a nice spruce stand and and uh, you know they're not, as we all know, they're not real big areas. You get into one of those and it might be. 50 acres or something that they haven't cut yet yeah yeah i i've shot plenty of big bucks in mature forests they do, mature forests will hold them bucks matter of fact 
you're more likely to have less roads anywhere near them. So that's a lot of times, even if them big bucks are living back in there, you know, earlier in the season and they cruise out of there during the rut or something, there'll be, there'll be some deer there. You can see better in there too. Yeah. Which is always nice. That's what I always liked about them is, yeah. is uh, you got cover still, but, but you can see a little bit better through those. Yeah. Through those mature forests. Yeah. And you can, uh, if you, if you're scouting in there too, you can cover a lot more ground than you can in old regeneration of clear cuts and all that other stuff. But keep us posted on your season. Yeah. Yeah. And remember too, uh, the mature forests you see over here won't be like what you have in the Adirondacks where there's just really not much for feed, you know. I, I notice hunting over there, the deer seem to feed mostly on those, um, I call them fiddlehead ferns, you know, the fern buds there. They're always pawing, even pawing through the snow to get them. But even in mature forest over here, there's there's all kinds of other stuff to eat, you know, moss on the blown down softwood trees and you know there'll be any place a big tree blows down there'll be an opening there'll be clumps of raspberries growing out of the roots or something there's there's plenty of food what do you think is an is the first choice that a deer won't go by as far as feed if they got them lined up and they got choices i don't know if there is a first choice necessarily but i know out there in the Adirondacks, so I know that and they, they rely on the beech nut years because it draws them all to those beech ridges, and I understand that because, like I said, there's really not there's not a lot of feed there other than, you know, if a tree blows down with moss, they have that feed too. But, you know, any place there isn't logging over there, it's, you know, there really isn't much for browse down at the... <coughs> Well, I, I was thinking kind of here when you, that's what made me think of it when you said, if there's some moss, the old man's beard, it's, it always seems to me like if they, if they're going by that and it's exposed, yeah, they're going to stop and eat that. I think it depends on the time of year though, the snow situation, where are we, are we hunting the first week of December or are we back hunting the first week of November? I don't think some of that stuff, they don't hit till later on how, and, uh, I, as far as like, I've tracked so many bucks and they walk right through a. Uh, um, yeah, what am I thinking of? Moss? <laughs> no, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll walk, they'll walk right through some, some stuff that you think they'd feed on a hundred times, they'll walk through and then they'll stop under a mountain ash tree and they'll eat every, every berry there, you know? Hmm. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I don't know. I, I, I find them stopping for that as much as I do anything. I don't know about you. Hey guys, Joe here. Wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Lake Parlin Lodge. We're a, uh, four season lodge. Located just south of Jackman. We've got cabins, lodge rooms, mini lodge. We're a big snowmobile destination in the winter. Full restaurant, bar, all the amenities that you need for your trip. Open all obviously through the summer right on the lake. Kayaks, canoes all included with the cabin. We also do a lot of weddings. So if you're looking for a destination wedding, we can do a wedding up to 200 people. And uh, of course, we've got our hunting season, moose season, deer season. So check us out. We're at lakeparlinlodge.com. Well, I think they like a variety anyway. I don't think they just like to eat one certain thing. Yeah. I used to think that they would eat cedar, you know, in the winter and later on when they got snow. But if there's a blown down cedar and it's the first week of the season, it's going to be pretty well trimmed. Yeah. Yeah. That cedar, they can, I think they can smell that for a mile away. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. The cedar comes down and they'll be in it and they'll eat the moss anytime. But deer just basically pick, you know, anyways. And, it's like any wild animal. They know what vitamins and minerals their body needs. I watched a, a doe and a lamb one time, and it was probably mid-October, maybe towards the later part of October, feeding on a fir tree, a small fir tree, eating the needles off that little fir tree. Now, it wasn't didn't need that for food. You know, we think that's something they eat in the winter when they're hungry, but there's some kind of a mineral or vitamin in them fur needles just picking i watched and just intentively watched and it wasn't like like eating the limbs off the brows and it seemed to be just like plucking the little needles off and it was kind of hmm. fun to watch so they're just you know you'd never even notice that if you're in the woods you wouldn't say hey a deer ate this these fur needles you'd never see yeah, it you know right, right. yeah yeah so yeah. Beach, I think beech nuts like that up here as compared to some places. I mean, I don't, I don't think the deer 
give two squats for the beach nut up here. I really don't. I've always they said that. They walk right through it. Yeah, I've yeah. always said that. A beach nuts up here is irrelevant to deer hunting. You know, it just, I don't think a lot of them get to the ground anyways. I mean, in a bump of years, they do. But the bears start up them trees mid-September, yeah. and they've got a lot of them before the season ever starts. And then what do hit the ground, the bears are still into them, rolling them around. But, I mean, I know all the years up here, I've hunted here, I can only remember one time I was tracking a buck and it, it stopped and was pawing around there under a tree there, and I noticed it was pawing for some beech nuts. But other than that, I don't, I don't remember them pawing around for any beech nuts. Hmm. A lot of people see it in the leaves up here and they think it's deer pawing, but if you look at it, it's actually like, it's rolled up in like little leafy windrows. You've all seen that. It's it's the bears rolling them. You right. know, they, they root and they roll leaves up in a windrow. A lot of people might think it's deer doing it, but it's not. But, yeah, they're just opportunists. They're just going to feed on a little of this and a little of that. I've seen, I see a small bear one time. He pulled pulled in a whole bunch of beech nuts like they do. They yard them into a big pile, and then they just sit right on their butt just like a kid sitting in front of a tv and they just sit there and eat, eat and i've watched that I'm a, i better watch that bear for a half an hour <laughs> just eating not paying them it's pretty on cool. the ground yeah sitting right on yeah. The ground eating them, yeah well that's what they do in the trees when they go up the trees they get up way up in the top near and set in a crotch and they break all the limbs into them and then they eat the nuts off the limbs and when they get all done it it oh i call them bears nest you look up in the tree and it looks like a big nest up there where they broke all the limbs back you know that, I do the same thing. That's how I eat. I sit down and I just <laughs> <laughs> I gather everything around in front of me. Yeah. That's that's then, how he maintains that two forty boyish that's figure. Right. I, I was just, <laughs> hey, I'm glad you're just stuck on two forty. I think <laughs> like, I, I think our listeners might want to, I, I ran into Joe the other night in a restaurant and, and he got a haircut. And I didn't even recognize him. Uh, he walked by like he didn't even yeah, know me. Yeah, so I'm looking at him. Jeez, who's that new kid in town? Because, you know, of you folks that don't know Joe, he's eight foot six. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at him. Who's that new kid in town? What a moose he is. And I'm thinking, you know, because you know everybody up here. We only have 100 people in our town, right? So I'm looking. So then I, I go up to the bar and I come back and I say, Jeez, that's Joe said. <laughs> I felt like, a bigger jerk. I didn't say hi to his wife. I didn't yeah. care about him, but... <laughs> Hey, we had a good laugh. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we got a good new restaurant, Jackman. I went without you, Hal, by the way. I was going to yes, call you, but it was Thursday fe- night. And yeah, the night I was looking for something to eat. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I should have called. It was a last-minute decision. We said, oh, we got to go try it out. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Nice to have in town. We're not like Rangeley where we have 15 different choices. Yeah. The name of that place is Moose River Lodge, folks. I'm mm-hmm. going to give a little plug because they're my friends and I work for them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, for you work for everyone. I guy for everybody, ever, yeah. Do you ever stop yeah. working? No. no. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm like a hit man. I'm always for hire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the other thing uh, Chris wanted us to touch on is uh, since that 35 whaling was mentioned – it is uh, going fast, so if if you have thoughts about wanting to get your name on the list for those, you want to call call Chris and get one ordered. Yeah, he said. Uh, I think he said it. He told me this morning when I talked to him, a guy called him and wants six of them. So a hundred is going to be gone pretty quick. But we still haven't got a definite date on them. And he says you got to get after them guys. Says you can't get after them, Chris. Yeah, get after Remington Al. Yeah, they'll get at, they'll get them when they get them, but. Like I said, as far as I know, the plan has always been they're gonna we're gonna get them in like lots of like twenty five at a time. We're not gonna have a hundred show up. Uh, and uh, Kittery Trading Post is gonna be the do the paperwork on them. In other words, distribute them. You know, do the FFLs and all that stuff. But we'll let you know when we get more of a word. But if you think you'd like to have one, then just get a hold of Chris and get your name on a list. And then as soon as we get a Kind of a set date there. We'll take deposits on them and go from there. Oh, we have to pay for them? Well, you don't, Mike. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. everybody else will. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, too bad not to have all this. We got jackets we can't sell and guns oh, that aren't available yet. It's, it's now that, uh, They'll come around. but Now, the, ja- the jacket, when they get back in production, the silent, that's going to be the same jacket, though, right? Yeah, it'll oh. be the same thing. We're just... We're working 
a silent predator is it's is to get the same wool the same quality wool you know because wool rich was a big deal and so it's gonna have to be up to that standard you know is it just the wool or is it wool with that pattern that's so hard well it's that's basically that's custom made wool it's that pattern is you've got to order i mean wool rich made it they've always made a checkered wool so that wasn't a big deal but believe it or not they don't just make that for nothing they they make the stuff for their own clothing or they did and then you'd have to order like so many yards of roll you know they they're going to run a production run for you so if it's i don't know say 500 yards at a time i don't know what it is but that's how you got to buy it so, so what's going on with Woolrich? They're out of business. They're done. Yeah. Never thought I'd see I the saw day. that announcement about, I wondered about this because I saw the announcement like about six months ago. And they actually, well, they, they've they gone out. They were, made, they were in Pennsylvania. And I guess they've sold the rights to it to a company in Europe. So evidently they can make it there, I guess, with the rights to that name and stuff. Hmm. But. That'll be, I'm sure, probably out of the question for us to get it from there. But what they did say they were going to keep, they had a regular, like a store to sell their own goods. Material. Not material, but goods, you know, jackets, shirts, whatever. I guess that's going to stay open. So, which begs the question, where are they going to get their wool from, you know, unless unless they are going to get it from Europe. But, so, anyway. So, if anyone out there has uh, some resources or contacts that are... uh yeah. We're checking into. Yeah, I know, Reach like out. I said, Silent Predator has got, they went to some other wool companies, and I know there's one, they got the samples back, and that's why Chris is going to go over and meet with them and some of the other Silent Predator distributors or something, but um, and see if it looks good, you know, and if it is, they'll have to order it up. Yeah. And I don't know how quick they can turn that over. I have no idea how that stuff goes. So. Hopefully by Christmas. Well, hopefully, but... We just got the word last week not to, we can still order. If anybody needs pants, you can order them. But I'd get on that right off, too, because that's limited because they bought X amount of checkered and X amount of that solid green for the pants. And It's surprising, and that you'd think that, you know, wool would be something you could just, well, one company's out. Yeah, we're going to order it from this one like it's something that's readily yeah. available. It's not, it's not like it's some fan of material. No, it isn't. But I think it's the manufacturing. For what I've I've looked at a lot of it, and and it's the it's the process how they make it. Have you been to the factory, the Woolrich? Yeah. No, but when you look at the wool, you can see that there's a different there's different weaves, there's different weights. I learned a little bit about it because I had to. But so the weight is, it's if you say like like what we were using on the. Jacket and pants would be uh, 24 ounce. That's what we chose. That means that a yard of that wool weighs 24 ounces. So, like, if you get a wool shirt, it might be 14 ounces thinner. So that's how it's made. But evidently, I think the problem is, is all the companies might not have the capability or they might not want to make that green checked. You know what I mean? And I know from looking at Silent Predator makes the... um, they have their camo clothing that they sell, and that is a uh, that's made by Pendleton. And I notice when you look at that, the weave is is a totally different weave. It seems to be a um, like a coarse coarser, coarser or a right? Yeah, it feels different. Yeah, yep. yeah. But I know <laughs> it's more like the Columbia type weave. Yeah, and then um, merino fil- wool is another one that you see on. Well, merino wool is is just. The kind of wool it is a lot of people make merino wool clothing but it's a that's like a finer type softer wool i don't know what the process of that is and then i know um what is it um filson they make a really really tight woven wool but i've never seen them make a checkered you know what i mean right they do make a green and that could be a possibility but they may not sell the material Fil- filson doesn't make a black and Red checked? They uh, yeah, they red might. Checked. Yeah, they, yeah, black they might. Red. red, yeah, but they might, yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't, no, I don't think they do because most of their stuff is green. 
or gray. Mm, I don't know about that. Yeah, one, boss. I'm not sure. Maybe, but they don't make a green check, right? No, but no. I know they make. I know most of their their uh, coats that you see, like they have a Mac and R and this and that, and they're usually a solid green. It, I've always seen them. Well, they're pretty high end. They're they're nice quality, but they always seem so heavy. Oh, they are. All their stuff is just super heavy when you put it on. Yeah. Yeah, you, the jacket would be, it'd be a great jacket, good quality, you know, if you're going to sit and stuff like that, but, but you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't lug it around track and it's not made for that, you know. Yeah. Our Silent Predator Big Woods jacket is the best hunting jacket I ever wore. Oh, it's on, yeah. I'm not plugging. I'm right. telling you. That's how I feel because if I didn't like it, I'd tell you. And that is the best jacket. And you, what, how, what do we wear? One little shirt under it, huh? Well, we, when we went to... <clears throat> when we went to the Woolrich Wool, we actually, I used to wear like a light shirt all the time under my under my other one, my just my long john and a light wool shirt, you know, until it got above like 40. But now I just wear my long john top under it until it gets down to like 15 degrees. That's all I need underneath of it. Yeah. But it's so, it feels so nice on you when you got it on that it's comfortable, you know. You know you got a jacket on. When you put it on, you feel that weight on your shoulder. You yeah. know, you, it's, yeah. it's a nice. Jacket. Well, it's a great fit, is what I noticed the first time I put yeah. it on. Yeah. And the arms and everything is a, is a great fit. Yeah, I know. When we had them, I was watching people at the. We've been selling them for a couple of years at the shows there. If you could get somebody to try one on, they was sold. So, huh, yeah. Lee? Yeah. Lee was yeah, absolutely. Oh, he's with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you if they pe- people put it on, you could see them kind of like they'd shrug their shoulders and they'd you could tell they liked how it but felt on. Let's them. build up this jacket that no one can get right yeah. now. <laughs> I was just sitting here going, "What are they doing?" Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, we'll have it but, again. We'll have it. Again. But Mike said something. You know, he said, "I'm not just plugging." We're, this no, no, I mean, we, yeah, but we've made a we've made a you know we've all talked and and we've had you know there's different offers out there for sponsorships, but we've really made a decision that. Uh, if if we're gonna be a part of it or or uh, you know work with them, it's gonna be something that we really believe in, and that goes to the jackets, it goes to the Onyx, it goes to the muzzle loader. Mm-hmm. You know, all this stuff is it's just the best out there that there is, in our opinion. Yeah, I've had lots of people come to me and why don't you want to sell this? Or you want to promote? It's really not too much, you know. I just if I don't, not to say other stuff isn't any good, but. There's some stuff that I, I would know myself that I'm like, there's no way I would use that. I ain't plugging it, you know. Yep. So got to believe in it to sell it. Yep. I, like, I, like I told Chris, I come into this world with nothing. I'm going out with nothing. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> can, can, can I have the Ram charger? <laughs> you, I know you ain't giving it to me. No. <laughs> You've already yeah. got all your time in it. I've already if, wrecked it enough. Yeah, if Mike had it, it would be gone in a year. <laughs> I'm the only one that hasn't broke it. Uh, I broke it? I haven't even driven it yet. I've broken enough for everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Not just that. Other no, vehicles. No, there's been other ones, but the Ram Charger was what? the one. That's you, a whole... you used to yell at the most when I broke the Ram Charger. <laughs> That's a, a whole... whole episode on everything Mike's broke. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I went up to get a moose out for his hunter one time. This is quick. <laughs> and sure, the moose just for dark, and they gutted it out and left it there. And we went back up bright and early first thing in the morning, drove all the way up Zone 4, take the Ram Charger, I take it. I went to help him because I took. I wanted to take the Ram Charger, right? Twitched it out. I said, "All right, Mike, I'll pull it up on the bank on the other side of the road and get it loaded." I said, "So get in the grass there in the weeds, and make sure I don't hit no stumps in there." You know, it's so pretty simple task, right? Pretty simple yeah, task. So yeah. he gets over there and he's standing in the weeds and he's just he's like motioning me with his hands faster and faster, like just like, "Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on!" All of a sudden, boom. Right up on a stump, no. tie rod, towed it right. Tie rod was so bent. I had, I could barely drive it. We got the moose loaded, <laughs> and I'm. <laughs> Listen to him giggle. I get down to the Golden Road, and I could at all. I had to drive like twenty miles an hour. It was all over the road. Finally, I got down to a. There's a pit there with a. There's a loading berm on it, like a, raw, a wooden crib. So I pulled in there, and I got my chain out, and I wrapped my chain on there, and. 
and I wrapped my chain around the tie rod and I put it in low range and I backed up real slow and kept getting out and looking at it. When I got it where it looked straight, I took the chain off, threw it in the back, and she was fine. <laughs> yeah. Right there on the Golden Road? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know where that pit is. I remember Hal mentioned it. Right on Norris Brook Road. Yeah. Yeah, Norris Brook Road. <laughs> you ever take a trip up north of Hal every road? Yep, down this one, this happened. Over here, that happened. <laughs> It's like a trip down memory lane. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jeez. Uh, you always have to tell that story though. That was oh. a moose that moose charged me. That was one of the few oh, moose yeah? I've yeah, he come right after me. And the guy I was with ran faster than me. <laughs> and he only had one leg. <laughs> <laughs> he had one leg and I'm yelling at him and said, uh, Bob, you got the gun. Shoot the moose. Don't run. <laughs> he missed oh. me by like three inches when he came after me. <laughs> oh. One uh, one of one of our hunters in camp last year. <laughs> took the first shot and uh moose charged him and it was being filmed not a very good filming job it would have been really good if it was a good filming <laughs> yeah. job but <clears throat> the guide was filming and uh when that moose charged he <laughs> the guide ran he got flustered the shooter did not because when the video came back on after the second shot the moose had hit the ground and and the hunters on one knee just as steady as could be he drilled that thing it's pretty cool video but yeah. it dropped within, I don't know, 10 feet of them or something. Yeah, Pretty cool awesome. story. Neat that's hunt. good one, yeah. 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 Well, well, I think we're out of time. How's this time goes pretty quick, don't it? Right. Yep. When you're having fun. Yeah. yeah. Talking about deer hunting. I mean, how yep. fast can it go? Appreciate you coming down and joining us today, Mike. Yeah. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, as always. Yeah. Where else can I get treated like this? <laughs> <laughs> my old buddy lifts it so big, he goes, gee, buddy, they don't leave you alone, do they? I, did. I think Lee left and went back to Rangeley about 45 minutes ago. Oh, you know what, it is, is you know quit, what it is? We quit talking about Lee. We got done with the guide, and we got done with his little yeah. film festival thing, and then I was like, yeah, I'm just going to check out. There's no he, more for me. Well, he gets he gets one of them live stories, like right on the tip of his tongue, he's going, should I tell this one? Or should I? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, he goes, no lip. No. Uh, I guess to think it all over first, to think <laughs> if there's anything <laughs> incriminating. Yeah. In you mean, you mean like when he mentions, um, <laughs> New Hampshire's kind of close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Well, all right. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Get on the uh, iTunes and give us a rating. We need some more ratings on there. I think we're doing pretty good. And uh, yeah, only if it's a good rating, though. You don't need to put yeah, any yeah. bad ones on. <laughs> yeah. well, and like us on Facebook. What's the other one? Instagram. Follow us. Yeah. What are we Stitcher. Doing? We're on Stitcher, but I don't think there's ratings on Stitcher. But Stitcher. YouTube. YouTube's got reviews. Yeah. Nice. What's Stitcher? Uh, that's that's uh, it's how you get newfangled podcast. younger generation yeah. stuff, Mike. If you got my aunt. sneakers, are called sneakers. yeah, it's right yeah. up there with the Facebook. <laughs> it's what we used to call the doctors on a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Stitch her yeah. up, buddy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lee finally speaks. <laughs> Sawbone, uh, fix me up. <laughs> yeah, fix me up. Uh, you want to see the other guy? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, did you get your own X upgraded to elite status? My what? On X. You better get with Chris. See, <laughs> he's another one that doesn't get the memos. Well, he he's older than you, Hal. Well, he, probably doesn't, he probably doesn't have the email. Well, well the only ch- email. He checks it once a month. <laughs> no, no, yeah, my, no, my kids read it to me once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, all shit. right. All right. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Till next time, good luck on the trail.